From Abuja, Nigeria, welcome, welcome to, to the GCN Show! Welcome to the GCN Show, brought to you by our friends over at Wiggle. This week, dishonesty, deceit, trickery, the reasons why we actually love pro cycling. We have spy shots of a prototype SRAM group set, the lowdown on what's definitely the hardest race of 2019, and why golf is the new cycling. Four! Oh no, that's, that's Geraint Thomas playing baseball. Oh yeah. Oh, he's got some weight behind that now, hasn't he? I know. This week in the world of cycling, we learned that Sven Nace, the best cyclocross racer of all time, he, he's still got it. Ah, oh, that's so cool, isn't it? Although, unfortunately, uh, this guy showed him how to do it better. This guy being Mini Sven, his son, Thibaut Nace. Yeah. How good is that? Smooth as silk. That was yeah. seriously impressive, actually, isn't it? Seriously good riding. We also learned this week that Lance Armstrong is back. That's right, back competing at the epic mountain bike stage race, La Ruta de los Conquistadores. Yeah, for those of you worried that Lance is somehow violating his lifetime ban, don't be, because the race actually doesn't come under WADA jurisdiction. And for those of you who think he is therefore somehow evading his punishment, you needn't be worried because the race is like punishment in itself. <laughs> Look at it, it's like torture. Yeah, I bet they're going to send Johan Brunil next year as well. And hopefully me too. Oh yeah, that's on my bucket you list. You want to go and do it? Oh, days. I want to get into it. Yeah, I'll come and watch. Oh, thanks mate, yeah. Uh, I've heard it's quite demanding to watch as well. Really warm, humid. Um, anyway. All this talk about Lance, uh, particularly actually following on from last week where Bradley Wiggins made those comments yes. about Lance. So you remember the ones, don't you? Where he said that Lance is the perfect tour winner. Yep, that's the one. And it's got us thinking about cycling's relationship with cheats and cheating. Because is there some kind of skewed logic in our sport that somehow justifies that kind of behavior? Because even if you are the most law-abiding bike racer of all time, there is still a massive element to which our sport, cycling, rewards devious and dishonest and underhand behavior. And we should iterate here, shouldn't we, that the terms you've just used there do not mean that we're talking about doping or perhaps motors within bikes, because no. of course they do not make any sport great. However, what we do mean is the fact that cycling is one of the few sports we can think of where you can win big races when you're not the best athlete. Exactly, and it all boils down, ultimately, to wind and the speed at which you have to ride. Because you can shelter on a bike, and because therefore you can exploit the hard work of your fellow competitors, you can therefore legitimately kind of cheat your way to victory if that's not a complete oxymoron. But that is the reason, fundamentally, why we think that professional road cycling is the most interesting, fascinating sport in the entire world. This is why, but do you agree? Well, we'll find out. I agree. I think it's an incredibly fascinating sport and it gets more fascinating the more you understand what's going on. To the untrained eye, it's probably quite boring. In fact, many newcomers will ask the same question, won't they? And many of you will have been asked this as well. If he or she is the strongest rider in the race, why don't they just ride away and win? Ah, yes. And in answering that seemingly simple question, you realise just how complicated our sport can actually end up being. Chess on wheels is perhaps an overused analogy, but it is true. You genuinely can win bike races by purely outmaneuvering a stronger opponent. For example? Well, in a breakaway, you skip turns because you're having a drink. Or you're eating. Yeah, or you're talking to your sports director. Or you won't aid the breakaway because you don't want to chase down a teammate in front. Yeah, or you're waiting for a teammate to come up from behind. Or you're just marking it for a teammate that's leading the race. Yeah, or you're just pretending to be tired when actually you're feeling really good. Oh, that's a good one. All the other way round, you're pretending to feel good when actually you feel shattered. Yeah, and then you attack when someone else is having something to eat. Yeah, or you attack on the other side of a central reservation so that they can't get onto your wheel and get slipstreaming. Yeah. Etc. Etc. And then when you get brought back, woof, a teammate goes over the top. Oh, this is becoming like a tactics 101 style. Yeah, masterclass. Uh, anyway, what you should point out is that the strongest riders do, of course, sometimes win. Good examples being the Tour de France and the Giro Rosa and Flesh Vallon, I guess. Normally yeah. the strongest win those races. Although that said, those winners still do have to be pretty careful with their expenditure of energy. That's true. But there is no denying that a rider like, I don't know, Thomas Vokler would not have won anywhere near the amount that he did. Worry not. 
for being pretty much the cleverest, canniest rider in the peloton. Agreed. And apparently Rui Costa is another example of being canny. I have heard from two separate sources within the peloton that he is known for not pulling his weight in the breakaway. Really? Is that frustrating for his breakaway companions? Absolutely. Yeah. It must be infuriating for them. Does Rui Costa care about it? Goodness, no. no, not at all. I mean, he's won 25 races in his career, and most of them are really quite prestigious. The World Championships, three stages of the Tour de France being a couple of examples. And what's remarkable is that he can have a reputation within the peloton of perhaps not pulling his weight in a breakaway, but yet he still gets away with it. <laughs> it's just fascinating, isn't it? Now, should we care like, as the spectators of these races? Yes, but only so that we can actually celebrate smart riders, celebrate their racecraft, but then you end up in a position where you have to ask the question, well, at what point does getting one over your fellow competitors in a race then constitute an unfair advantage? Well, that's it, when they break a rule. Well, no, I don't think it's as simple as that, is it? Because we've seen time and again, certainly in the last few years, where it's quite clear that ethics and rules don't really match up. There's this huge gray area in the middle, isn't it? And so maybe a bike race is just actually exposing the different ethical boundaries of the people competing. Well, if you're talking about ethical boundaries, what about that particular cycling nuance, which is inter-team alliances? Because that happens a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. In a breakaway, your breakaway companions are kind of your allies and your enemies at the same time. And in some rare situations in stage races, a breakaway companion can be your ally right to the finish because you might say to them, you take the stage because I'm going to take the leader's jersey. Yeah. I mean, that's almost like could argue it's sort of cheating us, the fans, isn't it? Mm. Well, it shouldn't be banned though, because it is those very quirky nuances that make our sport of cycling great. If you took away all of those tactical aspects that we've just been speaking about, what you would end up with is, well, you'd basically end up with a calendar full of time trials, wouldn't you? Oh, okay, so that's some thought. Oh my God. So ultimately, this all boils down to the fact that the race of truth it's just nowhere near as interesting as the race of deception. No, it's not. Long live legal cheating. That's, that's right. Yeah. Well, anyway, this is where you all come in. What do you think about this? I mean, is cycling's kind of weird relationship with dopers from the past actually just part of the fact that deception is a fundamental part of cycling? Yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts as ever. I think these could be some interesting answers yeah. to this question. All uh, right, we're going to head over to Japan now. Uh, we've recently had a Saitama Criterium over there, and Geraint Thomas didn't win, partly because he did pull his weight in the did breakaway, he? but Alejandro Valverde was very canny to take the win over yeah. there. Anyway, John Cannings was over on the ground. He spotted some pretty cool new tech. Well guys, I don't know if you know this, but I'm in Japan this week at the Saitama Criterium. Whilst here, I've just managed to actually see this. It looks to be a 12-speed prototype group set from SRAM. So we've got a different style design of the rear derailleur, as you can see. It's covered up here with a little bit of black tape. The cassette, that's a 1028. That's right, a 10-tooth sprocket. Uh, look at the chain as well. It's actually got flat outer edges on it. So it's similar to that, what you'd find on a BMX bike or something like that, where they go grinding on rails, I understand. Uh, chain set though, look at that, a total and utter redesign. And get this, a 50-tooth and a 37-tooth chain rings. Because of course, if you've got a 10-tooth sprocket at the rear, you don't need a big 53 plate to play with anymore, do you? A 50 will be absolutely spot on. That looks to be a new quart power meter too. Yep, spotted it here first. It's time now for Weekly Inspiration, where you send in your inspirational bike photos for a chance to win 50, 75, or 100 pounds in vouchers from our friends over at Wiggle. How do you win? Well, Dan and I decide. Yeah, we like the X Factor here, aren't we? Yeah, we are, yeah. Just either get a big tick or not. Uh, to enter, all you need to do is upload your inspirational photos using our uploader, a link to which is in the description below, or head over to Instagram and use the hashtag GCN Inspiration. Uh, without further ado, we shall get on with the third place person from this week, Sam Matteson, 50 pounds on its way to you for this photo. Long weekend equals hills and that is over in Pest in Hungary. I absolutely love that, Dan. Well, I love it too, and I was wondering whether it's because we both come from a mountain bike background, and it's kind of reminiscent of, it's like road single track, isn't it, through the trees? Road mountain biking, a little bit. I wonder whether it's down to tree bathing. What's that? Apparently, uh, you can actually monitor genuine kind of like hormonal responses, relaxation, when 
you're among trees. I like, I like being in the trees. Well, there you go. And you have to be going really slowly to tree bathe, so you, technically you can't do it on a bike. I bet I can. Well, maybe. yeah, I was going to say, maybe actually you, you can these days. Right, uh, right second place, yeah. we've got Ben, uh, who sent this in from his week-long training camp with his mates from the Balmoral Triathlon Club, and it's in uh, New South Wales Snowy Mountains. Triathlon Club, not a bar extension in sight. No, and I think they're wearing socks, Dan. Yeah, lots of socks in sight, on the other hand. Yeah. And all of them upright side. Incredible. Brilliant. Well, that was a great Sorry. training camp then. Uh, no, jokes aside, that is actually a very cool shot. Really nice. Gotta right. love a group ride, and particularly when it starts lining out and you're motoring. Yes, well, £75 great. on its way to you, Ben. I wonder if you'll split it with that group. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> yes, less than ten pounds each. Maybe take twenty for yourself and divide the rest. <laughs> we'll let you decide. Uh, the winner this week, though, is Alistair from Solden in Austria. Take a look at this. Wow, that this is, is a, cool, isn't it? A long climb to a sign that says it's the highest paved road in Europe. Then a quick Google search revealed that it's only the second highest. Unfortunately. Ah, well, it's still inspiring. It is. To us, isn't it? It does look beautiful, yeah. Yeah, and probably that's under snow these days, isn't it? So we'll have to wait maybe until June next year to go and ride it. But still, that's absolutely brilliant. All right, so there you go. There is your top three for this week. 50, 75 and 100 pound wiggle vouchers on their way to you. And as Dan said at the top, if you would like to enter, it's very simple. The link to the uploader is in the description. And of course, there is Instagram with the hashtag GCN Inspiration. It's now time for cycling shorts. We're going to start cycling shorts with news of golf. Now as cyclists, we are all too familiar with the big helmet debate, why you should have to wear one, should you have to wear one in the first place, or indeed why you shouldn't have to wear a helmet. Well, it seems that now golfers might be faced with those very same questions. That's right, because statistics are catching up with them too. Turns out that golf might actually be a risky sport. Yep, according to Golf Magic, which uh, is actually a website, believe it or not, uh, there is a risk of injury to 1.8 of every 1,000 players. In comparison to rugby, long being considered a dangerous sport, where it's only 1.5. Mm. Unfortunately though, cycling eclipses the both of those. Yeah. It's more dangerous at 2.1. Although it doesn't top the charts, weirdly, basketball seems to have the highest injury rate, so perhaps it's not our perception that needs working on, but rather than mathematics. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, anyway, no matter what's said, uh, cycling has been considered the new golf. Uh, maybe now golf is the new cycling. Well, it could be. It could spice up your commute into work, couldn't it? If you walk to work. Whoosh, yeah, yeah, I like that. And remember, that is statistically as dangerous as commuting by bike. Interestingly, at the very same time, Bicycle Network in Australia have called for their compulsory helmet laws to be revisited. And that is not just from those people who want more personal freedom and personal choice, but also because apparently those compulsory helmet laws have led to a reduction in the number of cyclists over there. Yeah, now predictably, there was a fairly swift and damning rebuttal from safety campaigners and researchers. But I tell you what, Dan, this debate feels like it's so polarized now, I don't really, know what to think anymore. Like, I'm just sitting on the fence. Oh, no, nothing wrong with sitting on the fence. Just make sure you wear a helmet whilst you're up there. I will do. Yeah. <laughs> Cycling Industry News has been reporting on three possibly very interesting new e-bikes from big automotive manufacturers. Yeah, that's right. First one is from General Motors, who are actually announced a crowdsourcing campaign to try and name their two new bike offerings. Neither of which, I'll be honest, actually look like my cup of tea, particularly. Mm, more so Ducati with their MIG R. Yes. Uh, that one is apparently going to be launched later on this month at the biggest motorcycle trade show, the EICMA. Catchily named, yes. Yeah. it is catchily named. So much so, I couldn't really remember what it was. <laughs> uh, and also, Elon Musk has even suggested that Tesla might get in on the e-bike act. Yeah. Now, I would take what he says with a pinch of salt, but all three of these suggest quite good news to me, because if big car and motorbike manufacturers feel that it's somehow worth their while to start making e-bikes, and proper e-bikes, not just kind of concept things, then maybe actually that's suggesting that they're a little bit concerned that people are gonna be buying less cars, less motorbikes, and transport is gonna be all about mm. e-bikes. Good news then. Fingers Do you crossed. need to wear a helmet with one though? That's the big question. Oh, You damn. still sat on the fence? No, I think I would definitely wear a helmet <laughs> on an e-bike. Well, uh, I wear a helmet all the time anyway. 
But anyway, oh. that's beside the point. Oh, I'm gonna have loads of comments now. Right, let's move away from that and yeah. on to professional bike racing. The season's almost come to a close. There's one more criterium over in China. Don't know who'll win that one. Ooh. Anyway, all eyes are starting to go on to 2019. Now, last week it was the Tour de France route announcement and this week it was the Giro d'Italia. That's right, and as Dan reported on yesterday's racing news show, it's brutal. No more Namby Pamby 60 kilometer long mountain stages. Yeah. This is proper bike racing. How about 230 kilometers with 5,700 meters of climbing, including the Gavia, which tops out over 2,600 meters above sea level, and the Mortirolo on the steep side. Man, that yeah. is brutal, isn't it? That is yeah. stage 16. It is the queen stage, but there are a whole host of horrendous looking mountain stages that are both long and incredibly tough. And even the three time trials, in fact, have their fair share of climbing. They certainly don't look like they're going to hinder the climbers in the race. No. Oh man, I can't wait for that. How long is it until the start? It's 187 it? days until oh. the start of the Giro d'Italia. Oh, that sounds like, what's that, like six months? Six months. That well, at least we've got the classics before then. Yes. Yeah, that's, oh yes, it's not long now till it all kicks off, is it? It is time now for Hack forward slash bodge of the week and a reminder of how to put your photos into us with your hacks and bodges. Uh, hashtag GCN hack on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram or upload them using our uploader which to remind you is in the description below this video. Uh, cracking on with things this week, to start with we have this from Joseph. My word. Well I guess you could ride it naked couldn't you with a chamois on the saddle. Why is there a chamois on the saddle then? Sort of makes sense doesn't it? I probably won't be using it on my bike, but nevertheless, it probably no. is quite comfortable, yeah. That could be the one instance where you would want underwear between your buttocks, <laughs> buttocks and the saddle. Yeah. But uh, anyway, there we go. Yeah, thanks for sending that one in. Uh, this one from Colin Turner. He said he saw this in a classified ad uh, in Taiwan oh yesterday. Is that, is that like triathlon bars made with Meccano? I don't know. I mean, he's managed to bend it round by himself, by the looks of it, without the use of any kind of heat. Yeah. Triathlon legal though, so that's good. Drafting triathlons, nice little stubby uh, extensions They probably there. work just as well as any that you buy in the shops, don't they? Well, yeah, and I suppose if they snap on you, then uh, there's marginally less risk than it being the rest of your handlebar that snaps, but uh, yeah. anyway. Then if they do snap, it doesn't cost much to replace. No. <laughs> Still a bodge. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, definitely definitely not one to try. Uh, much like this one, the interesting bike barrow combination sent in by Adam Barker. Wow, you yeah. could fit quite a lot in there, couldn't you? I mean, that's got to be a proper thing. That doesn't look like a hack, does it? Someone might well be used for somebody's actual work, might not it? In which case, I think you should be applauded yeah. because that effectively takes the place of uh, one of those motorised wheelbarrows that you get in Italy. You know the ones? No. Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe she's been using notice. Well, I'm going to say hat because I think that somebody uses that for their work, as I said. Uh, moving on, we have got this from Louis Capino. Uh, DIY aero bottle holder. I see he's just placed his bottle there on the front of the bar extensions, which he's bought rather than made. I think there's a bottle cage there, mate. Oh, there is, yeah. I mean, it's not the most aero position, is it? It's also hard to hold your aero bars if there's a bottle in the middle, isn't it? That's a good point. Yeah. Why would you stick the bottle there? Well, Why? Yeah, but you put it under the saddle, that's where all triathletes have it, isn't it? Oh, they have two under the saddle, don't they? Yeah, I remember that from yeah, our triathlon millions. video last year. Loads and what, loads what and loads of them. What we could have learned from triathletes. Yeah. Short video, that one, wasn't it? Also, there's no top tube bag on there, so I'm wondering whether that's actually been well thought out at all for a triathlon <laughs> bike. Uh, anyway, right, we'll finish off with uh, well, some pretty exciting news, actually, for us, Dan. So, uh, if you watched last week's show, you'll remember the Tron bike that Hannah had created for Halloween. Anyway. We said we wouldn't mind riding a Tron bike, and she's very kindly offered to make us some. Really? Yeah. So next year, Hannah, we're looking forward to our DIY Tron kits coming through the post in time to uh, kit us up for Halloween. So thank you Happy very much. Days. Yeah. Thank you very much. Next up, it's the caption competition. Last week, Cy and James showed you this photo from the Tour de France presentation of Geraint Thomas next to Chris Room and Julian Alaphilippe, and we do have a uh, winner. It's John Travolta, mate. Is it? End. Yeah, yeah. What's Chris doing there? No, the real John Travolta, not no, even Chris. Yeah. Anyway, we do have a winner of the GCN Camelback water bottle. Yeah, and can I just say, this is one of my favorite captions for months, this is genius. Sent in by Info Alp Links. that's a strange name. Uh, anyway, caption. Froomey, can you stop looking at your power meter? It's the off season. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe his name's Mike. 
because he's added that on the end. <laughs> no, I, well, that's a good guess, Si. Maybe it is Mike. Well done to you, Mike. Uh, send us a Facebook message with your address and we'll send this out to you. Uh, here hey. is this week's photo. It comes from the Saitama Couture. Well, it looks quite cold looking, Mike. Alejandro Valverde's outfit there. All-star cast though, isn't it? Look at that, Valverde, yes. Garant Thomas, Marcel Cattell, and indeed Vincenzo Nibali. Yes, I, I should get you started. Garant, I know it's the off-season, but I think maybe you should start looking at your power meter again. <laughs> oh, shots Catty. fired. Yes. Right, anyway. Down, set the tone. Uh, hopefully, you can lift it from there. To be with a shout at winning a GCM water bottle, uh, we will pick a winner just for next week's show. So, there we go, get stuck in. It's easy for you to say. I've been catching up on your many great comments after a week's holiday this morning. I've picked my favourite. How was Bologna, by the way? It was good. Yes. Was it? Yeah. I ended up having to pay for quite a lot of beers because you have to do a lot of kilometres actually. Did you? Mm. Mm, anyway, my favourites are as follows underneath last week's show. This from CNE. Who cares what people wear on a bike? Wear a thong with a chef's hat if that's what you want to do. <laughs> Too right. Well, I don't know actually. I think if someone turned up on a group ride wearing that, I probably wouldn't want to ride with them yeah, that much. And you still don't know where about the helmet thing either, do you? No, exactly. Yeah, good point. Uh, under how do you make carbon fibre frames, which is an absolutely mega video if you haven't checked that one out, uh, where Ollie went over to see how Look do things. Uh, Carl Ford uh, said, um, referring to Ollie going from uh, the factory all the way back to France, he said, yeah, that is a long run, Ollie, but you don't hear the camera guy complaining about having to get there first to set up the video gear. Oh, I see the audio guy muted that part. Well, actually, Carl, a little bit of behind the scenes info. They all ran together, then Ollie had to stop outside with a makeup artist just to kind of touch things back up again before then carrying on with the filming. So, yeah, yeah that was how it was well done. Well explained. Yeah, so. thanks. And finally, underneath your Sufferfest video with Chris, this is from Rob uh, Chastain. I too did happen to notice that the GCN presenters were suffering terribly on their indoor bicycles as I munched popcorn and <laughs> sipped coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. James was really suffering as well doing his yoga. Just to, uh, just to make that I noticed point. the same thing as I was sipping on free beer in Bologna so <laughs> last week as I watched your video. Uh, right, coming up on the channel this week on Wednesday, gravel bike suspension yes. is a thing, isn't it? So I went to Iceland and visited Lauf and went behind the scenes with them. Uh, Thursday, we have six hacks for the perfect bike fit. And make sure you keep your eye on GCN Tech that day too because it's a brand new product launch. Very exciting uh, from our friends over at Continental. That's right. Friday, as ever, is Ask GCN Anything. Yeah, on Saturday, Saturday, brace yourselves, because we built ourselves a hyperbike. Oh yeah, what happens when you unshackle yourselves from the UCI rules? You get one of these, so make sure you stay tuned to that. Unfortunately, we haven't got a hyper presenter, have we? No, no. Standard ones. Yeah. Well, slightly below standard, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. Uh, right, on Sunday, you've been asking for it, we've done it. We're going to tell you the difference between a gravel bike and a cyclocross bike. Ollie and I uh, did that one over in Italy, and we've even invented a new sport, so uh, make sure we check that one out. Mm. Slightly below average apart from Emma, should I point out, just in case I get another text <laughs> through after the show comes out. Yeah, uh, Monday, of course, is the racing news show, and indeed, it's the GCN show 305 now. What a weird ending. We'll leave that in. Before we get on to Extreme Corner, a little shout out to the GCN shop, because if you are being organised enough to get Christmas presents in early, we got some early bird offers for you. Yes, that's right, make sure you have a look. We've got, for example, 20% off if you buy two base layers. We've also got 20% off our red t-shirt and hoodie collection. Yeah, high vis is 10% off. And the free beanie of your choice when you purchase a grey or a red sweatshirt. Now that's an idea for Christmas, isn't it? You buy yourself a sweatshirt and you give someone else the free beanie. Yes, oh. good idea. Devious. Uh, you don't have too long to take advantage of this. It closes on midnight this coming Friday. That is GMT time. Uh, so head over to shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com to take advantage of those offers. Uh, there's that link in the description below. Yeah, right then, Dan. What about Extreme Corner? This week is pretty extreme because a chap called David Wise went and taught himself how to do a backflip straight onto dirt. Is that Wise? happen on this Whoa, fair play. <laughs> 
I'll tell you what, it doesn't matter how many times you practice doing a backflip into that foam pit, it must be terrifying the first time you go to do it outside, mustn't it? We should find out, mate. We well, should I'll make do it James into the do phone it. Pit. I'm not, yeah, all right, let's do it. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, I know. I'm not suggesting. Great having guinea pigs these days, isn't it? Yeah, Crash test dummies. <laughs> yeah, cheers, James. <laughs> Off you go. All oh, right, on that note, Dan, we should probably leave it there for this yes. week, shouldn't we? That is all for this week's show. We'll be back at the same time next week. Yeah, if you haven't seen Ollie's video from the Look Factory about how you make a carbon fibre bike, do make sure you check it out. It is a brilliant watch.